We open our Bibles together tonight to God's Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The sermon tonight is the sermon that I was privileged to give last Sunday morning in Pittsburgh at the installation of Reverend Matani, John Matani, our son-in-law, as their new pastor. I thought it would be good to preach this sermon here as we await and desire our own minister and pastor. It must be very clear in our hearts as we ask God for a pastor exactly why we want a pastor. And namely, the text will tell us that, that he might preach to us the gospel of Christ. I also wanted to preach it because it's on my heart, it's on all of our hearts, it's always on my heart that there be young men in this church who would be convicted by the Holy Spirit to enter the gospel ministry. And then finally, as we go along, I trust that you'll see that the burden of the message that we're going to have here applies uh, to each one of us in our own calling and walk of life. So we read the Word of God in 1 Corinthians 9. You remember that in this epistle, the Corinthian church had many troubles, many struggles, and that the apostle is going from point to point, and now he's talking about the whole issue of Christian liberty. Chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye also, are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power, the word power here means right, have we not right to eat and to drink? Have we not right to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only in Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not the milk of the flock? So what he's talking here about is that he and Barnabas, he, and he personally, had the right to ask the Corinthians to financially support him, something he had not asked them to do. Verse 8, say I, not these things, say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that threshest in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power, this right over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, nor suffered, but suffered all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void." For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 
For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews... I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under, law, under the law, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body, I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. May God bless that reading to our hearts tonight, our text will be the verses 16 through 18. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power or right in the gospel. Beloved congregation, in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is teaching the truth of freedom or Christian liberty. He's teaching the truth of the true freedom that is found alone in Jesus Christ. He's not talking about a political freedom. He's not talking about the supposed freedom of autonomy that I get to do what I want and follow the things that I want to follow. He's not talking about freedom from human oppression, but he's talking about a freedom of living no more to the sinful self that we learned about this morning, but living our life unto Christ who hath loved us in all things. This freedom, he has taught, is rooted in our deliverance from a crushing burden of our sin and from the enslaving power of sin upon us. But he has shown that this freedom is very practical. He is showing in those chapters that our Christian freedom is that we give up of our own selves in order that we might be a blessing of love unto others and that we might advance the gospel of Christ. That's how he defines freedom in these chapters, and I'm going to be repeating this a few times tonight, and I'm going to repeat it now. Freedom, according to these chapters, is giving up what you think is your right. He called it a power. What we think we have coming what we believe legitimately is our right to do in our Christian life. Our conscience does not burden us. 
we may legitimately have the right to do this. He says Christian freedom is giving up that right for the benefit of others and for the furtherance of the gospel. The Corinthians had sent to Paul a question about the eating of meat that was offered to idols and was being sold in the marketplaces. Those with a strong conscience, and Paul says yes, their knowledge is correct, responded that an idol is nothing and meat is meat. But they went so far as to say, and we can even walk into that idol's temple and eat it right there. There are others whose conscience would not allow them even to buy it in the marketplace. And so the apostle comes to address himself to that question. And in chapter 8, he says, yes, yes, you're right. Your knowledge is correct. But your understanding of Christian liberty is faulty. faulty. Christian liberty, he says, is not simply the right for you to do something in your conscience. But Christian liberty is also to put aside your right because of love for another and for the sake of the gospel. He says, don't let your liberty become a stumbling block to others. Now in chapter 9, he has not changed the subject, but in chapter 9, he is using himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as an example of giving up one's right in love for others and for the good of the gospel. While the Apostle Paul had been in Corinth for a year and a half, and then for the next five years after, at which time this epistle is written, Paul had never asked them for any support of himself, and they had never given him any. He refers to those in verse 3 who were examining him in Corinth. There were those in Corinth who said he's just a mercenary. He's in it for praise and he's in it for money. And so Paul had deliberately, when he was there with Barnabas, worked, supported himself with his own work of tent making. He forego, he forwent his own right. He shows in the chapter very concisely that the church does have an obligation to support their pastor in his life. But he gave it up as an example to them that Christian liberty is giving up one's right for the purpose of love for others and for the advancing of the gospel. But now in our text, he comes to something that he tells them he was not free to do. There was something that he would not do, that he may not do, that he was convinced, that he was convicted that he would never do, and that is he would not give up his charge from Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. He says to them, that's different. Necessity has been laid upon me. I cannot forego this. I must preach the gospel. In fact, He is explaining to them that he gave up all of his freedoms that he personally had in order that he could preach the gospel in Corinth for the sake of his calling to preach the gospel and to avoid all of those contentions. He simply gave up his right for support in order that he could preach the gospel because he said as a minister, I am compelled. There's one thing I cannot stop doing. This is what I must do. I must preach the gospel of Christ because I have been sent by Christ to preach the gospel. There is an obligation of the church, verses 4 through 14, to support the minister according wisely and according to the best of the congregation's ability. But Paul says, you don't pay the minister to preach. You do not pay the minister to preach. It's not per sermon. The minister does not perform his ministry to be paid. The church is called to support him so that he is free to do his ministry. 
Paul says, I will do this regardless of compensation because it is Christ who has called me to do this. He believed his calling was sacred. It was something God gave him to do. I said that the sermon is about the ministry, but it's certainly about all of us. For we too must learn to give up all things in order that we might do the service that God has called us. I think of, for an example, mothers and children and giving up of so many things because your life is focused on your children. It was the love of Christ that compelled Paul to give up his rights so that he could do the one thing. It's the love of Christ that must teach us to give up many things so that in our Christian life we may do the one thing to serve him. So I call your attention to the minister's sacred calling, a sacred task, a sacred obligation, and a sacred resolve. From this text, we learn clearly that a minister's calling is to preach the gospel of Christ and that it is Christ himself who separates men to do this. Now, from the two epistles to the Corinthians, we could draw up a list of God's will for the work of a minister in a church. We could take it right from that portion of the word of God. From this epistle, I could show you that as a pastor, Paul went visiting home to home. He was a pastor. I could show you that a pastor is called to have leadership, which is exactly what Paul is doing in this epistle. I could show that a minister must be filled with teaching, and that's exactly what Paul did. He taught wherever he went. I could say that his calling is to give counsel to the members, All of these tasks are important to a minister, but the text points to the chief and to the primary duty of a minister from God, and that is preach the gospel of Christ. All of the other tasks that a minister is called to do in the church are like spokes on your bicycle wheel coming from one hub. The one hub is preach the gospel, and out of that come all of his other aspects. But this is what he is sent to do and is given by the Holy Spirit a compulsion to do it. Necessity is laid upon me. This is the thing that I must do. And this compulsion was heard, for example, also in the man Martin Luther referred to this morning when he stood at the Diet of Worms and said, I can do no other. You want me to do something else, deny what I believe, I can't do that. I am under constraint. It comes out very strongly, this calling to preach the gospel in verses 16 through 18, when five times Paul uses a word for the gospel. He uses it three times in its verb form and two times in its noun form. For reading verse 8 and 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And then verse 18, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, third time, I may make the gospel, same word, but now a noun, make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. That word preach or preach the gospel is one word and it means proclaim good news. To preach is to proclaim the good news. We get our word evangelism from this word. To proclaim the gospel is good news. To preach the gospel is to proclaim the good news. There are two words in the New Testament 
to describe preaching. One is a word that refers to an, an ambassador of the king, and it refers to the one who sent him. And then there is this word, and this word, preach good news, centers on the content of the gospel that a minister is called to preach. He must bring the good news. That good news is the cross of Jesus Christ. That good news, as we read this epistle, the apostle comes back to it time after time, is Christ and him crucified, the power and the wisdom of God. It pleases God through the preaching of the cross to save them that believe. So that the message, the good news, is what God has done for his elect people, for us in Christ. That's the good news. It's what God has done by the giving of his Son to make an atonement and a payment for our sins. The good news of the gospel is not what you need to do to make yourself worthy of salvation. The gospel is not simply about the bad news of what you cannot do, but it's about the good news of what God has done in the death of his son on the cross in our place. The words substitutionary atonement are a beautiful summary of the good news that God put his son in our place to make a complete payment and atonement for our sins before God. The apostle puts it this way, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he, God, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Another way to say it is that the content of the gospel, the good news, is grace. It's God's undeserved favor and power to bring us out of the darkness that we learned about this morning, the darkness of our own nature to the light of the love and grace of God. The gospel, therefore, proclaims the reality. This morning we heard reality of what a man, of what we human beings are. The gospel says the truth. You learn the truth in the gospel. Good news has to be true news. We are created by God in Adam. We are fallen in ruin. We are chained in darkness and unbelief. You did not evolve. You did not pop after a wonderful chance into existence. You are not ascending to be everything that you can be. You are not autonomous who can dismiss God. You are not that. You and I were made by God, and we are fallen from God, and we are dead. But, but God, Ephesians 2, which was read this morning, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, has raised us up together in Christ. The good news is God. And the glory of his love and grace in Jesus Christ. The grace that does not say that salvation is all prepared for you and the Amazon truck has just stopped and put it on your door and all you need to do is open it up and it's yours. That's not the good news. But the good news is a grace through the word and spirit that opens my heart to know my need and to give me the peace of Jesus Christ. It's good news for the chief of sinners. This 
is the work of the minister. Necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the good news. Paul says, I'm not free. I am, he's not regretting it, but he says, I am not free to give up this task. To preach this gospel to which God has separated me, the gospel of God, appointing sinners to the only way of Jesus Christ, pointing Christ alone as the one who fulfills the holiness and the justice of God by bearing wrath that was due to me and given to me. And Christ was given to me of grace. Paul says, necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. Quite a while ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the Grow Group, I'll let you come up. I was going to pick it up, but I'll let you come up and look at it yourself. The Grow Group made a little plaque here at the foot of the pulpit that any minister who comes to this pulpit and bows his head to pray is going to see. And the words here are from John 12, and they're the words of the Greeks who came to Philip and to Andrew and said to them, Sir, we would see Jesus. That must be the prayer on your heart when you enter this sanctuary and for your new pastor when God gives him, you must say, Sir, we would see Jesus. There's much that goes under the title of a minister, and there's many things today that fill sermons. Politics and social reform and psychology and, as you know, many more things. A minister is called to preach the gospel of God revealed in the Holy Scripture, the good news, the real news, the true news, the only necessary news of what God has done for us in Christ. Now there's another word in the text which also speaks to the task. There's the word preach the gospel, but there's another word that points to the seriousness of this task, and that's found in verse 17, (coughs) where we read, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will a dispensation, there's the word, dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. The translation there uh, is perhaps misleading. He's not referring to what we might think, dispensation, Old dispensation, Old Testament, new dispensation. Is Paul saying he's a new dispensation minister? It, it leads us in the wrong direction. The translation is stewardship. A stewardship of the gospel is committed to me. A minister is a steward. He's to preach the gospel and he must preach the gospel because he's God's steward. And you remember with me in the scriptures that a steward was somebody, most likely a slave, who was entrusted by a wealthy owner to care for all that he had. All of his possessions, his children, his land, his servants, his honor and his name and his investments. He were entrusted to the steward to use to bring prosperity to his master. We're acquainted with that. Children, you'll remember Eliezer, the steward of Abraham, who Abraham commissioned to find a wife 
for his son Isaac. Or you remember Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house. And even though Potiphar's wife tempted him, he was faithful in all that Potiphar had put into his hand. Paul had already spoken of this in chapter 4, verse 1, when he said, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. A minister is someone to whom God has entrusted the mysteries of God in the scriptures, not hidden sayings, but the very things that arise from the deep heart of God, all of those things of God. A minister is entrusted to care for the children of God and for the honor of God. And he must do all things to please the one who gave him this stewardship, God, under whom does a minister labor? Yes, he does labor under the church and the elders and deacons. But finally, to whom? To whom will you, as his steward in your calling, answer? Whose steward is the minister? He's God's. That's why Paul says, you don't pay me for this. I'm not working for a paycheck in this. I'm a steward of God. That means that a minister must be careful and diligent in handling the word of God. He must bring God's word to us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ's sake, as though God did beseech you, be ye reconciled to God. He must faithfully bring the word of God, not his own word, not the word of man, this is so very important in every age, and it is increasingly important in our age with all the agenda of our society and all the pressures being placed upon the pulpit and the church as to what we will believe and what we will preach. A minister and the church, too, are the stewards of God, and we must bring the things of God not the agenda of a man, not the agenda of the world, but God's Word. And how can a minister do that unless the Word of God is personally to him the joy of his own heart? And how can he do that if he doesn't ask God every day to examine him. The pulpit is not a man's pulpit. It's not our pulpit. It's God's. And this, if you are visiting tonight, this shows why we do here what we do. Why we have this sermon that's going to go beyond 45, 50, 55 minutes tonight. Why do we do that? We do that because we find in Scripture that we are called in the preaching to exposit, to exposit, to bring forth the Word of God. The minister must stick with the text that he's preaching. He's a steward of God. He has the Word of God. He must deal with that. He must not stray from that text he must bring the text, and that's why it's also very good for the minister to be encouraged to expound on books of the Bible, because that gets him 
and gets the congregation into passages that we would normally not pick. There's texts that I would pick because I pick them. And that's why it's important for us to have the Heidelberg Catechism that we preach in the mornings out of the Heidelberg Catechism so that all the mysteries of God are preached to us. From that sacred task, for that sacred task, rather, there must be a conviction. The minister must feel a sacred obligation before God. And that's the main thrust of the text. Paul is saying, I have to do this. God gives me joy in doing it, gives me peace in doing it, but Paul says, I'm not free here. I am under constraint. For though I preach the gospel, listen to him. He's saying, I'm compelled to preach. I must do this. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. I have to do this. Yea, woe is unto me. He would feel himself cursed. He would feel himself rebellious to his God if I preached not the gospel. Notice how he starts. Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. You could use the word boast of. He's saying, though this privilege and this calling has been given to me to be a preacher of the gospel, I do not take personal pride in preaching. I'll say that again. Though I preach the gospel and call to do that, I do not take personal pride in the preaching. That's something for a minister to think about. Because a minister is just like you. And he have, if he has acceptance and support, pride makes his head swell. But Paul says, I have nothing, no personal pride that I am a preacher. I must, but I don't pride myself in it. Why don't you pride yourself, Paul? Well, he says, because the gospel is not my idea. I didn't make it up. I'm a steward. It has been handed to me. I love my master, but I didn't make it. I didn't make the contents. God made the contents. And secondly, and here's the point, secondly, he says, I don't take any pride there because I did not choose me to be a minister of the gospel. If I had, he says, if I had gotten into this on my will, then perhaps I would glory because I did that. But I didn't choose myself to be a minister of the gospel. He says in chapter 11, verse 23, I delivered unto you that which I received of the Lord. He received not only the content of the gospel, but he received the call, the irresistible call from God, from God. He says, I have nothing to boast about in this position because God laid this call on my heart that I had to do that. The Spirit set me aside. Now think about the Apostle Paul and the ministry. And think about his conversion in Acts chapter 9 when he was on the road to Damascus. I assure you that the last thing on his mind was that he was aspiring to be a pastor and a minister of God in Jesus Christ. That was, the, yeah, that was not on his mind. We read Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He was filled with hate 
with Jesus, against Jesus Christ. And he sought to kill, not make disciples, but to kill the followers of Christ. But sovereign, amazing grace came to him. To convert him, yes, but the same grace to lay upon him in his heart and soul the call. Saul, said Jesus, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. God's changed him. And then you remember, children, God sent the prophet Ananias, and he said, Ananias, I want you to go to the, the street called Straight in Damascus. I want you to knock on the door of the house of Judas, and you'll find a man called Saul who has been persecuting the church. I want you to give, open his eyes, and then I want you to tell him. Tell him he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And what do we read? And straightway, Paul preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. God calls men to the ministry. That's the single most important thing. The single most important thing is not the difficulties, it's not the troubles of the churches now, it's not, well, who, if, if these things happen, who would want to be a minister? That's a worthy consideration, but that's not the heart of the issue. God must convict a man in his heart so that he says, necessity is laid upon me. Woe if I preach not the gospel. The apostle is referring to a compulsion that he can't avoid. He's referring to an internal call. He's referring to the work of the Spirit convicting him in the calling that God gave him. Now, ministers are different. There's, we must not clone ministers. Different abilities, different personalities, different strengths, different weaknesses. They must not be all alike. If they are, if they're all alike, then, you, then they're not following Jesus Christ. Each one different. And the conviction to the ministry may be worked differently in a man's life through God's providence, or maybe later in life. The Apostle Paul himself explained that in Galatians 1, the verses 14 through 16, when he says, I see, I see God's providence in my calling. He says, I understand why God sovereignly made me a Pharisee. He says, I was above many my equals and more zealous of the traditions of my father than any of them, my fathers than any of them. God gave him the ability to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Because God, he says, would later on separate me from my mother's womb and call me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the nations. Paul had mastery, we might say. He had almost memorized the Old Testament. God was preparing his missionary to bring the gospel through the world. The same breath in which God spoke salvation to Paul, with that same breath and spirit, he convicted Paul in his heart. Paul says, I didn't volunteer. I didn't enter the ministry because I thought, well, that would be a good profession. I like theology, nothing wrong with that. I love the church, nothing wrong with that. 
But that's not why Paul entered the ministry. We all love theology. We all must love the church. The Holy Spirit convicted him. Jeremiah puts it this way. Jeremiah the weeping prophet, who the moment God called him had nothing, nothing but trouble. He ended up being placed in the stocks and dropped down in a pit. And later on in the end of his life, he's kidnapped and taken out of the land of Canaan. He had nothing but problems. And for a while he said, Then said I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Every time I mention the name of God, it's nothing but trouble. I'm going to quit. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up, in my, shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He said, I'd be more miserable if I didn't speak than if I do. And not only in inward compulsion, but Paul is speaking here of almost an enlistment, an involuntary enlistment in which, so to speak, he did not have the choice. He says, if I do this thing willingly, that is, preach the gospel, then I have a reward. But if against my will, then a dispensation, a stewardship of the gospel is committed unto me. Paul does not mean there, if I enjoy the ministry, then I will be rewarded. If I do the ministry, grudgingly, I won't be. He doesn't mean that. But he means, if I chose to do this, I have a right to expect a reward. If this was my idea, if the initiative was mine, if it rose, arose from me, but it didn't. I was conscripted, conscripted. I was enlisted. Doesn't mean that he did his ministry grudgingly or unwillingly. Paul loved his Lord and the gospel. But Paul says, God called me to do it. It was from him. Is there something else you would like to do? My experience is not different from any other minister, I'm sure, but I can remember my senior years in high school. It was on my heart and mind to be a minister. I didn't talk to people about it. But I finally mustered up the courage to go talk to my pastor, Professor Decker, I can still remember sitting in his study and he talked to me and I told him what I was thinking and he listened carefully and he asked me different questions. And then when it was all done, he said to me, Carl, is there something else you would like to do? It took me a, a moment to figure, to understand what he was saying to me. He wasn't saying, well, I really don't think you should try to be a minister. But he was simply saying, in good conscience, in good conscience before God, is there something else you might like to do? Then he said, then go do it. Go try it. Go try it. And if you can do that, then that's God's will. But if in good conscience you can't, then you need to go to seminary. A minister has no room to boast. He is compelled by the Holy Spirit. God called him. He must preach the gospel. And so Paul says, I'm resolved that I will remove all hindrances to the gospel right here in Corinth among these people who are very difficult. 
I'm resolved to make the gospel here without charge. That is, I'm not making an issue about the support. I will teach them, and he does, that the congregation has an obligation before God to care for its minister so that he may be free to do his ministry. He, 14 verses, he lays it right out. But he says, I'm not writing about me. I'm not asking for back pay. I don't want you to do this to me. It would be better for me to die than for you to do that. I will not abuse my right, my power. For me now to say I have the right of support, I won't do that. I'm not going there with you. you I will not take support. But you need to know I will preach the gospel. He was not motivated by gain. He was not motivated by carnal reward. He was ready to set aside his own rights. He was convicted simply to do what God called him to preach the gospel. Freedom in Christ is when we set aside our right for the cause of others, for the good of others, and for the cause of the gospel of Christ. Paul's motive was he will carry out his ministry without boast, but he will preach the gospel. We pray for this, for every minister that ever stands behind this pulpit, and for the man who will be our next pastor, that God binds him to God, and that he understands that he's not free to draw back from his calling, but that he is constrained by the love of Christ to be your preacher and pastor. This same grace must compel us. We must all be willing to give up self in order to be a blessing to others and to the body. In our marriage, in our family, in our church life, we must be ready to give up self for the cause of the gospel. When God sends us our next pastor, receive the word of God he brings and let this congregation continue in love and self-sacrifice to be committed to serve the extension of the holy gospel, the good news of God. Amen. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. It's important for us to understand as Christians the truth of conviction the work of the Holy Spirit in the soul. It's important for us to understand that those who serve in the church must partake of that conviction and that the minister must have that conviction. And since thou art the author of this conviction, and since thou art the God who has promised to set men aside, from the body, from the church, for the ministry, according to thy choice, convict men here of the gospel ministry. Amen.